Good morning. Whether you are worshiping with us here in person or are joining us online, welcome to worship for the 21st Sunday after Pentecost. At this time, let's all take a few moments to prepare our hearts and minds for worship with the prelude. Please stand. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose teaching is life, whose presence is sure, and whose love is endless. Amen. Let us confess our sins to the one who welcomes us with an open heart. I invite you to take a few moments of silence for reflection and self-examination. God, our comforter, like lost sheep, we have gone astray. We gaze upon abundance and see scarcity. We turn our faces away from injustice and oppression. We exploit the earth with our apathy and greed. Free us from our sin, gracious God. Listen when we call out to you for help. Lead us by your love to love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. By the gift of grace in Christ Jesus, God makes you righteous. Receive with glad hearts the forgiveness of all your sins. Amen.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Sovereign God, you turn your greatness into goodness for all the peoples on earth. Shape us into willing servants of your kingdom and make us desire always and only your will through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated.
Good morning. The first reading comes from the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressor, transgressors. The word of the Lord. Let us read now responsively Psalm 91, beginning at the ninth verse. Because you have made the Lord your refuge and the Most High your habitation, no evil will befall you, nor shall affliction come near your dwelling. For God will give the angels charge over you to guard you in all their, your ways. You will tread upon the lion cub and viper, you will trample down the lion and the serpent. They will call me and I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. The second reading comes from the fifth chapter of Hebrews. Every high priest chosen from among mortals is put in charge of things pertaining to God on their behalf to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with the ignorant and the wayward, since he himself is subject to weakness, and because of this, he must offer sacrifice for his own sins, as well as for those of the people. And one does not presume to take this honor, but takes it only when called by God just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself through becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, you are my son. Today I've begotten you. And he says also in another place, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. The word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink, and the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to, ser to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Friends in Christ, grace and peace to you from God, Trinity of love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. During some time spent in a waiting room of a doctor's office, I found myself reading an issue of the magazine National Geographic. And there was a story in this issue called Blood Ivory. And it's about the ivory trade that still flourishes in many places despite it being internationally banned. And unfortunately, the use of ivory is often linked to religion, as it is used for icons and statues and amulets. Thailand was one of the places that the article featured, and there a great deal of the ivory seems to be used for amulets or charms. The author, in pursuing the story, found that amulets were everywhere in Thailand. Many Thais wear amulets, sometimes many at a time, to bring them good luck or to protect them from harm or black magic. There are countless vendors in the streets selling amulets, many of them made from ivory. Virtually every taxi cab has amulets hanging from the rearview mirror. And the Thai army even once distributed amulets to its border soldiers to ward off Cambodia's black magic. We may scoff at that kind of belief, although I bet there are some among us who have a pair of lucky socks that we swear by. But I wonder, when we hear Psalm 91, when we cling to the promises we find there, is it offering us the equivalent of a powerful amulet? Because you have made the Lord your refuge and the Most High your habitation, no evil will befall you, nor shall affliction come near your dwelling. We read that together a few minutes ago. Is our membership in the body of Christ, our faith in God, a talisman, an amulet that will keep us from all harm? The language in this psalm has certainly been used that way. Many throughout the years have championed the idea that God's faithful will always triumph. If you really believe, if you really pray in the right way, and if God really loves you, God will always protect you. In the most extreme cases, we find things like snake handling, where as a part of the worship service, Christians will pick up venomous snakes, believing that Scripture promises that God will protect them from snake bites, and that handling snakes is therefore an act of faith. Now, most Christians don't go that far, of course, 
though many of us maybe do feel like we can point to a time when the hand of God was upon us, saving us from danger. But the truth is, God's people don't walk through life completely unscathed. Life just doesn't work that way. Most of us have lived long enough at this point to see the truth of that. And if we hadn't before, living through the pandemic has made it abundantly clear. We have experienced trial and suffering in our own lives. We've seen affliction come upon loved ones. In times like those, it's possible to read a psalm like this and to hear it as anything but gracious, good news or promise. A question sneaks in and it becomes a torment. If God protects those who belong to him, and I'm suffering, doesn't God love me? What did I do or what did that person do to put us outside of God's circle of protection to break the power of our amulet, so to speak? Unfortunately, it's all too easy to go down that road and many people have had the knife twisted in the wound, either by their own self-judgment or by judgment in the voice of another. But I don't think this psalm is rightfully meant to function as an amulet. A little bit of context for it can be helpful. The psalms were organized and placed beside one another very intentionally, and Psalm 91 can in some ways be seen as an answer to Psalm 90, which we heard from last Sunday. Psalm 90 ponders the frailty, the sin, the sorrow of human life, and it asks God to give us a wise heart so that we can count our days rightly. Psalm 91 then reflects on what it means to live with a wise heart like that. It means living with a deep trust in God. But this trust is lived out and expressed not in a lack of suffering, but in the face of it, the whole book of Psalms, really the whole Bible, witnesses to that. God's people face trouble of all kinds. The consequences of their own foolishness, the ravages of war and violence, the pain of disease, grief, loneliness, loss. Their identity as people of God does not make them immune from that. But within that struggle, they cling to the presence and power and love of God. Psalm 91 claims God as a refuge. That word implies a place of safety in the midst of a threat. In a verse before our reading for today begins, the psalmist uses the image of a fortress for describing that refuge. Martin Luther lifted up that picture of God as our fortress in his famous hymn, which we'll sing in a couple weeks on Reformation Sunday. But there's another image in this psalm that I think I like even better for thinking about what it means to find refuge in God. It's found in verse 4. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. We find this same imagery in other psalms too, like Psalm 63, 7. For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I sing for joy. Jesus uses it as well in both Matthew and Luke, where he says that he has desired to gather the people of Jerusalem to himself, like a hen gathers her brood under her wings. I love that image of finding our shelter under God's wings. You could picture this being in a nest, a bird tucking her chicks in tight against her so that they can rest, shielded from the outside world. Or you can imagine this protection in flight, soaring beneath God's outspread wings, still in the midst of the storm, yet finding shelter in the presence of the Almighty God. I will be with them in trouble, we hear God say in verse 15. This presence of God in the midst of trouble is where we find our strength. Because of it, we are able sometimes to experience 
deliverance, salvation, satisfaction, even when we are walking through trouble and opposition. It does not mean that we will never experience that trouble or that we can be foolish or reckless and expect God to keep us safe from the consequences, a sentiment that I've unfortunately heard expressed way too often during this pandemic. But Jesus understood this difference well. After his baptism and before the start of his public ministry, Jesus found himself driven by the Holy Spirit out into the wilderness for a time of intense preparation. In this time, he was tempted by the devil three times. Matthew tells us that as the second of these temptations, the devil took Jesus to Jerusalem and placed him up on the very pinnacle of the temple. Looking down from this great height, the devil said to Jesus, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. The devil knows the Bible too, as they say, and here he is quoting Psalm 91 to Jesus. Jump, Jesus, the devil invites him. If you're who you say you are, then like the Psalm says, you're protected. God will save you and everyone will know that you belong to God. But Jesus, knowing the heart of scripture as well as the words, quotes another verse back. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Jesus refuses to claim the promises of Psalm 91 as a way to avoid suffering. He rejects a self-serving use of the promises as unfaithful as testing rather than trusting God. In the section of the Gospel of Mark that we've been walking through lately in worship, Jesus makes it clear again and again that his identity as the Son of God and Messiah is not going to exempt him from suffering. It's not going to mean the glory of military victory or triumph according to the way of the world. That's what the disciples are failing yet again to understand in our gospel passage today. Jesus has predicted for the third time his death and resurrection, but it's in one ear and out the other for the disciples. James and John pull Jesus aside and ask him to promise that they will be the ones to sit at his right and left hands in glory, in his victory. You have no idea what you're asking, Jesus tells them. Can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink or be baptized with my baptism? Yep, James and John say, we can do that. It's almost comical to hear them say that, knowing as we do how clueless the disciples are and how faithless they will prove to be when it really comes time for Jesus to drink his cup. But they seem to be operating under the same interpretation of the psalm as the devil was trying to sell Jesus on. Surely, those who are loved by God will walk through life unscathed by evil. Jesus knew better. He knew the heart of the Psalms, the promise of Scripture. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. He knew what was to come for him, saw the cross waiting for him in Jerusalem, but he knew that God was with him in the midst of, not apart from, the journey he was undertaking. The fact that he suffered and died on the cross would be a major stumbling block for many when it came to believing that he was the Messiah. God would have sent angels to save him if that were true, so that he wouldn't dash his foot against a stone. But it was precisely as he walked through the depths of agony, sustained by the knowledge that God was with him, that Jesus lived out his identity as Emmanuel, God with us. In his suffering, God did bear him up, did deliver him and show him salvation, though it was not what the world had expected that to look like. And through him, God delivers us and shows us salvation, satisfying us with eternal life. 
It is tempting to want to believe that our belief in God, our baptism into the church, will mean that we will be saved from all the trouble that is full in this world. We can fall into the trap of clutching a cross worn around our neck, literally or figuratively, as if it were an amulet that would ward off evil. And we can convince ourselves that that is true faith, trusting that God will protect us no matter what we do. But it is more faithful still to walk the path that Jesus walked, clinging to the promise of God's satisfying, sheltering, redeeming presence in the midst of the real, unavoidable brokenness of the world, whether that is trouble that crosses our own path or trouble we enter into for the sake of our neighbor in need. For in the light that breaks into and scatters the darkness, God will be with us and will show us God's salvation. Amen. You may be seated. With the whole church, we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen set free from sin and death and nourished by the word of truth we join in prayer for all of god's creation for the gift of the church handed down through the ages and for all who carry out the servant ministry of jesus we praise you send your holy spirit upon all who are discerning calls to ministry in its many forms and equip them with your gifts we pray for our bishops elizabeth eaton and jim dunlap for Pastor Sigrid, and for our faith partners in the Kawira Congregation and the Northern Illinois Synod. Lord, in your mercy. 
For the lush and abundant habitat you provide for all your creatures, we praise you. Provide healing for the earth so that waterfowl, reptiles, animals, fish, and all living things flourish as you intend. Lord, in your mercy. For all who work toward peace and who lead nations with a servant's heart, we praise you. Bring justice for all who suffer violence, persecution, discrimination, hunger, poverty, and homelessness, and create places of refuge for all people. Lord, in your mercy. For all who do the work of healing in mind, body, and spirit, we praise you. Surround and comfort all who struggle with depression, anxiety, cancer, diabetes, dementia, or any illness, that all may be healed. We lift before you Rick Hoff, Foy Stambaugh, Allison Trump, Carl Groover, Eric Sprankle, Jason Sprankle, Caleb Trump, Nancy and Jerry Fry Markle, Chris and Ron Swartz, Bob Markle, Linda Riley, Penny Nace, Samantha Zorba, Kim Reichert, Linda Rebert, Pamela Hamburger, Morgan Howard, Shanna Dickinson, Roxy Brott, Gloria Atkins, John Reed, and Caleb. We pray for the loved ones of Clyde Stump, Alan Dickinson, Julie Carlos, and Chuck Hoover. May they find comfort in the promise of the resurrection. Are there others for whom we pray, either out loud or in the silence of our hearts? Lord, in your mercy, for all who volunteer for the vitality of this congregation, we praise you. Strengthen and encourage greeters, ushers, office volunteers, cooks, counters, committee and group leaders, teachers, students, singers, builders, nurturers, and all who serve with generous hearts. Lord, in your mercy, confident that you hear us, O God, we boldly place our prayers into your hands. Through Jesus Christ, our truth and life. Amen. I invite you to stand. The peace of Christ be with you always. At this time, you may share a sign of Christ's peace with one another. Let us pray. God of abundance, you cause streams to break forth in the desert and manna to rain from the heavens. Accept the gifts you have first given us. Unite them with the offering of our lives to nourish the world you love so dearly. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy God, our bread of life, our table, and our food, you created a world in which all might be satisfied by your abundance. You dined with Abraham and Sarah, promising them life, and fed your people Israel with manna from heaven. You sent your son to eat with sinners and to become food for the world. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his life given for us and his rising from the grave, we await his coming again to share with us the everlasting feast. By your spirit, nurture and sustain us with this meal. Strengthen us to serve all in hunger and want. And by this bread and cup, make of us the body of your Son. Through him, all glory and honor is yours. Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is Christ's table, and he is the host of this meal. So come, you who have much faith and you who would like to have more. You who have been here often and you who have not been for a while. You who have tried to follow Jesus and you who have failed. Come, Christ promises to meet us here. You may be seated.
Please stand. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Lord of life, in the gift of your body and blood, you turn the crumbs of our faith into a feast of salvation. Send us forth into the world with shouts of joy, bearing witness to the abundance of your love. In Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Just a reminder that next week we have one service only at 9 o'clock, which will be followed by our congregational narrative event led by Deacon Marsha Roscoe, and I hope that you will all join us for that. Please do note that because we are hosting a member of the Synod staff, she is an assistant to the bishop, we will be sincerely asking everyone who attends to wear a mask um, in line with the bishop's COVID recommendations and guidelines, which are more stringent, stringent at this point than um, ours are. Deacon Roscoe also cares for a parent who is fighting cancer and is immunocompromised. So as an act of solidarity and hospitality, we're just asking everyone for the one Sunday to wear a mask. Are there other announcements today? People of God, you are Christ's body, bringing new life to a suffering world. The Holy Trinity, one God, bless you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. The living word dwells in you. Thanks be to God. <laughs>